Hello, good morning and welcome to St Peter's West Night and Four Morning Prayer on Friday the 15th of June. It's a commemoration of Evelyn Underhill and we'll be using common worship, daily prayer, provision, <coughs> morning and evening prayer during ordinary time towards the beginning of the Red Book if that's where you're following. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. The Venite, a song of triumph, also known as Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving and be glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have moulded the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts as at Meribah on that day at Massa in the wilderness, when your forebears tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my works. <clears throat> Forty years long I detested that generation and said, This people are wayward in their hearts, they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> so we turn to our Psalter at the back of the Red Book, or by scrolling down, for the appointed psalmody this morning, and the numbers are 51 and 54. Psalms 51 and 54. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit. Have mercy on me, O God, in your great goodness. According to the abundance of your compassion, blot out my offences. Wash me thoroughly from my wickedness, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my faults, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence, and righteous in your judgment. I have been wicked even from my birth, a sinner when my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth deep within me, and shall make me understand wisdom in the depths of my heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear of joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Turn your face from my sins, and blot out all my misdeeds. Make me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me again the joy of your salvation, 
and sustain me with your gracious spirit. Then shall I teach your ways to the wicked, and sinners shall return to you. Deliver me from my guilt, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. For you desire no sacrifice, else I would give it. You take no delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. May be favourable and gracious to Zion. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will accept sacrifices offered in righteousness, the burnt offerings and oblations. Then shall they offer up bulls on your altar. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit. We use the prayers that follow in silence. Behold, God is my helper. Save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your power. Hear my prayer, O God. Give heed to the words of my mouth, for strangers have risen up against me, and the ruthless seek after my life. They have not set God before them. Behold, God is my helper. It is the Lord who upholds my life. May evil rebound on those who lie in wait for me. Destroy them in your faithfulness. An offering of a free heart will I give you. And praise your name, O Lord, for it is gracious. <coughs> for he has delivered me out of all my trouble. And my eye has seen the downfall of my enemies. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Behold, God is my helper. So we turn back to morning prayer for Friday in ordinary time, beginning with common worship and daily prayer for the canticle, a song of humility. Raise us up, O God, that we may live in your presence. Come, let us return to the Lord, who has torn us and will heal us. God has stricken us and will bind up our wounds. After two days he will revive us, and on the third day will raise us up that we may live in his presence. Let us strive to know the Lord. His appearing is as sure as the sunrise. He will come to us like the showers, like the spring rains that water the earth. O Ephraim, how shall I deal with you? How shall I deal with you, O Judah? Your love for me is like the morning mist, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For loyalty is my desire and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Raise us up, O God, that we may live in your presence. Born in 1875, Evelyn Underhill was in her thirties before she began to explore religion. At first she wrote on the mystics, most notably in her book Mysticism, published in 1911, her spiritual journey brought her in 1921 back to the Church of England in which she had been baptised and confirmed. From the mid-1920s she became highly regarded as a retreat conductor and an influential spiritual director. Of her many books, Worship, published in 1936, embodied her approach to what she saw as the mystery of faith. She died on this day in 1941. So to our first Bible reading of the morning, Judges 6 from 25. 
Book of Judges, chapter 6, verse 25, onwards. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull, the second bull, seven years old, and put, pull down the altar of Baal that belongs to your father, and cut down the sacred pole that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold there in proper order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the sacred pole that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the townspeople do it by day, he did it by night. When the townspeople rose early in the morning, the altar of Baal was broken down and the sacred pole beside it was cut down and the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. So they said to one another, who has done this? After searching and inquiring, they were told Gideon, son of Joash, did it. Then the townspeople said to Joash, bring out your son that hope, so that he may die, for he has pulled down the altar of Baal and cut down the sacred pole beside it. But Joash said to all who were arrayed against him, will you contend for Baal or will you defend his cause? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself because his altar has been pulled down. Therefore on that day Gideon was called Jerubal, that is to say, let Baal contend against him because he pulled down his altar. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together and crossing the Jordan they encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the spirit of the Lord took possession of Gideon and he sounded the trumpet and the Abiezrites were called out to follow him. He sent messengers throughout all Manasseh and they too were called out to follow him. He also sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun and Aphtali and they went up to meet him. Then Gideon said to God, in order to see whether you will deliver Israel by my hand, as you have said, I am going to lay a fleece of wool on the threshing floor, if there is dew on the fleece alone, and if it is dry on the ground all around, so dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will deliver Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so, when he rose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, do not let your anger burn against me, let me speak one more time, let me please make trial with the fleece just once more, let it be dry only on the fleece and on all the ground, let there be dew. And God did say that night it was dry on the fleece only and on all the ground there was dew. This is one of those stories as it continues that is a great, um, great lessons for life in it. We saw Gideon's discussion with God yesterday, um, arguably um, a Christophany or an appearance of Jesus before his birth. For Jews, the words, the expression, the angel of the Lord meant a physical human manifestation of God, which for Christians is obviously Jesus. So it might take some mind stretching to grasp the concept but we had arguably Jesus talking to Gideon <coughs> in a very sort of human conversation. Gideon says, I'll just go off and make you some refreshments. Will you stay there? Yes, I'll wait until you come back. You know, that sort of level of prayer and Gideon's uh, uncertainty about doing what he'd been told to do, despite that being an answer to prayer of God's people to release them from the oppression of the pastoralists who kept trampling over their crops and eating and taking what they had planted and were growing. <coughs> so the first thing he has to do is destroy um, the altar of Baal. And if we're interpreting this as Jews or Christians for our time, we must follow the one true God and not only do it in words, but in actions also. And he actually has to take a stand and destroy so that it's no longer possible to worship the false God of Baal. False God only in that God is the true God. There would still have been magic and power and transactions going on between those worshippers of Baal and the powers that went under that name and how life went on. <clears throat> so it was a significant thing. And I love the humanity of the story that we're told he doesn't do it with a great triumphant, courageous, just stomping up and doing it, he does it by night, secretively, covertly. <coughs> so uh, unlike many scriptural stories, it wouldn't make much good, um, so it wouldn't do well for cinematography, creeping about in the dark, well, I suppose it might do, but not in that great, great sort of Ben-Hur style. <coughs> but uh, nevertheless, he's found out, and his father gladly speaks for him and says, well, you'll speak up for this 
God of Baal, if Baal is a God, let him speak for himself. One wonders whether he was actually seeking out for his God or just taking the mick out of religion in general. Um, but it's saved Gideon's life, which is just as well, because the next thing, and the Midianites and the Malachites um, gather, and uh, Gideon is moved to blow his trumpet, sound of the trumpet, which is, I guess, a, um, an expression that means called people to war, because immediately we're told that various tribes get together. And um, we're then told that Gideon effectively goes off and has another pray, another discussion with God, but this time um, God isn't present, but we have this idea of the Gideon's fleece, or putting out a fleece. I don't know quite how far into common language it's gone, but it's certainly a reasonably well-known expression where things are put in place to test whether something is the right course of action, certainly within Christian circles. I suspect Jewish and others too. And so he asked that the ground will get, the fleas will get wet and the ground will stay dry and then the other way round, whichever way round it is. And uh, so it is, which is enough for him to know that he needs to go forward. And very often in life when we face situations, battles, especially when we have a degree of responsibility, it is always good for us to be assured that God is with us. And this particular scheme of guidance seems to be enough for Gideon. So to Luke 14, from 12 to 24, our second reading, verses 12 to 24, chapter 14 in the Gospel of Luke. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbours in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for what will for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. <clears throat> One of the dinner guests on hearing this said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time of the dinner he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my apologies. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going, out, going to try them out. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I have just been married and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. And the slave said, sir, what you ordered has been done and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. As I noted yesterday, we're told that Jesus notoriously ate with tax collectors, prostitutes and sinners. Well, actually, this meal is in the presence of a Pharisee and the eating of food with somebody in that culture, as to some extent is the case today. <coughs> they were in cahoots. They were in league. The Pharisee's copybook would have been blotted by entertaining this radical preacher and Jesus likewise would have been known to have had some regard for this Pharisee whether it was we're not told it may have been Nicodemus it may have been the Joseph of Arimathea was it who gave him his tomb his grave but there may have been others too so there are at least two significant Jews within that number whom it could have been but there may well have been others and it doesn't appear to have actually been whilst there were those there watching it doesn't appear to have been specifically set up as a trap when we have these discussions that are put into that context, which are basically robust Jewish debates of the various different factions and preachers and teachers discussed as they do today, <coughs> their view and understanding of the schools of thought within the tradition. It doesn't seem to me there's anything particularly more hateful than that, but it just might uh, slightly ruffle our feathers in polite English society where ordinarily, <coughs> unless it's clearly a debate we don't really can't really uh, tolerate this sort of apparent verbal aggression and so we need to be told it is in fact a debate and then we're quite happy to take our gloves off and roll up our sleeves as it were so initially it's fairly straightforward when you give a meal invite people who can't pay you back <coughs> and uh, that could be taken to mean 
the instruction to this chap giving a meal. Just don't invite friends, invite people who can't pay you back. But it could also be interpreted um, in terms of religion, in terms of charity, how we spend our lives, what we do. It can be extended beyond that immediate instruction. And he may well, Jesus may well have known this person and known the people that were there were friends, were acquaintances. <coughs> he may have been speaking to them as church, <coughs> as representatives of church. Of course, we immediately think on an individual level these days in our culture, but he could well have been speaking to his host as a representative of what he presented, of what he represented. Then our second passage is uh, almost an extension, really. It's uh, a third person, third person story saying more or less the same thing, but it's slightly easier perhaps to connect the um, parable version of the instruction to other interpretations and applications. We can perhaps map <coughs> the someone to God. We usually call, they're usually called the master or the king. Maybe there are different versions in the different gospels. I don't immediately know, straight, can't remember straight away, here and now. But this is often thought of as being an encouragement and exhortation to think of that dinner as being the kingdom of God, the gospel, the marriage supper of the Lamb, what have you, and an exhortation to preach the gospel. So I think that's this interpretation among Christians. And these various different excuses. I bought five yoga of oxen. Is that to do with the Torah, the five books? I don't know. I bought a piece of land. <coughs> do they connect to the Jewish ideas of land and temple? And law. <coughs> I've just been married, so I can't come. So the initial were invited, then a second lot were invited, and then they go out a third time. <coughs> to those who were really unexpected, really unwanted, an embarrassment, <coughs> causing offence to those who would expect to have been. And so shall we return to morning prayer on Friday for the responsory. Forsake me not, O Lord, be not far from me, O my God. Forsake me not, O Lord, be not far from me, O my God. Make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation. Be not far from me, O my God. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Forsake me not, O Lord, be not far from me, O my God. Song of Zechariah the Benedictus. Give your people knowledge of salvation, O God, by the forgiveness of all their sins. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophet, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Give your people knowledge of salvation, O God, by the forgiveness of all their sins. Let us pray. Sovereign Saviour, Spirit, 
three in one, one in three, we thank you as we do Friday by Friday for what you have done for us, that ultimate sacrifice. For humans to speak of ultimate sacrifice, which we do, is one thing, but we are all mortal and destined to die. But from you who are immortal, your dying is ultimate. And you have exchanged life for death, that we who had no power to make that transaction receive life. You who were in complete relationship became isolated that we who are cast adrift may belong. Or excluded may belong. You who are health became broken That we who are sick may become well. And you who are rich became poor, that we who are poor may become rich. And so the list goes on, and we thank you for that, not being able to understand or comprehend even the physical pain, let alone all those other injuries, wounds that you sustained in our stead. And we pray for our Christian siblings around the world, <clears throat> even in our own land, perhaps, who for the sake of faith are persecuted by colleagues, families, neighbours, the state, warring factions as they endeavour to stand for the truth, not to take sides, but to help and care for all who are wounded, frightened. And we pray for all those organisations that seek to assist them, bringing them freedom from that persecution. Thinking of those that are specifically Christian, like Christian Solidarity Worldwide and Open Doors, Barnabas Trust, but also those that work across religions and across injustice, such as Amnesty International. So with Operation World, we today pray for the Holy See, the Vatican City State. <coughs> Bearing in mind this suggestion of prayer is written by an evangelical organisation. The first challenge for prayer is its loss of credibility and its second is for what is called spiritual renewal. We pray and give thanks to you and for Pope Francis and his influence, which arguably for some is not what it should be, but for others is a good thing. It seems to me it's, he is a modernising influence which will open the church to more opportunity than it closes doors on. But I thank you for the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church's faithfulness and obedience. We pray that you help it deal with those things that give it a bad name, just as we pray the same for Anglicanism and the other great traditions of the faith. We pray that all Catholics, many millions strong, will experience radical conversion, cultural transformation, that it has been insisted by their pontiff, apparently, is essential to faith. Yes, we pray that you breathe your life onto those who would say they were Catholic especially those who are not practising, that you would give them a zeal and a commitment. 
We pray the same for all of faith, all who have been, or whose faith is lukewarm, <clears throat> that you will make it the core of our being. Make yourself the core of our being and all we do for you to be that which energises and inspires, impels us, compels us. With Christian Action Research and Education, we give thanks for everyone whose medical, nursing and therapy skills help people with physical illness and injury and those with mental and emotional illness and injury. We pray for Christians in particular who are trained and experienced in counselling and prayer ministry. We pray that they will be professional in the application of their skills. Back to Pope Francis um, from Green Christian. He has issued a new ma missive entitled Economen Economicae et Pecuniariae Questiones, or something, which envisages a new <coughs> economic system governed by three principles. No profit is, in fact, legitimate when it falls short of the objective of the integral promotion of the human person the universal destination of goods and the preferential option for the poor. It calls for an overhaul in the management and regulation of financial markets to promote more ethical trading principles and a more equitable society. Money must serve, not rule. I thank God for that. I pray that it is widely circulated, read, understood, promoted <coughs> as uh, I forget it now, but um, that previous paper that was very influential. I pray that would make a difference across the Roman Church and beyond. And in our benefice, if I can open it. From our cycle, we ask for an increase in faithful attendance and hope in our Warmwell Church membership. And we thank you for your, the people who are happy to be on our electoral rolls. We pray for Jenny and Warren, Mike and Pam, Penny and Dave, Anne and John, Bob, Susan, Timothy, Gerald and Valerie, Martin and Anne, Pam, Eve, Tessa, David and Wendy, Christine, Richard, June, Robin, Peter and Wendy, Heather, Derek, Jill, Roger and Hilary. <coughs> on our church membership in Oamoy. We pray for your health, wealth and prosperity, your salvation, healing and deliverance on these. We pray that you draw people to faith and onwards and upwards in the faith. Give us all a fuller experience and understanding of your good self through prayer, study and service. May we, in fellowship with others, worship, walk and witness. Give us a hunger and a thirst and desire, a dissatisfaction in your absence and your lack and in our apathy that we may be driven to serve, that our identity will be in you and what we do, what you do through us as we follow your call. Pray for each of these who find things difficult that you will hear and answer their prayer, that they will be moved nevertheless to call on you, or uh, even so to call on you, and that they will know that to be an experience of faith in itself, that your presence with them will assist them in their difficulties, Pray for those for whom things are going well, that they will be moved again by faith to help and assist, and where they do offer that assistance in your name, that it will extend your kingdom not only in their life but in their communities. And pray that you establish a life group in that village. So close, but so far. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, <laughs> 
<coughs> Gracious Father, you gave up your Son out of love for the world. Lead us to ponder the mysteries of his passion, that we may know eternal peace through the shedding of our Saviour's blood. <coughs> Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.